Welcome to Laud the Margins webinar on intersectionality of movements, solidarity with Palestine. We're really excited to have an amazing group of panelists today. Um, before I introduce our panelists and the topic of today's discussion, I'd like to uh, share a little bit about Law at the Margins. Law at the Margins is an innovative platform that seeks to bring together organizers and lawyers who are all committed to social justice. It seeks to lift up grassroots organizing and movement building and to share information and strategies across not only the United States, but also the globe. I encourage you to look at uh, articles at lawatthemargins.com and subscribe and support us. Today's discussion, Intersectionality of Movements, is inspired by Angela Davis's new book, Freedom is a Constant Struggle, Ferguson, Palestine, and Foundations of Movement. And I want to thank Haymarket Books for giving registrants of this uh, discussion a 30% discount on the book. We borrow from Angela Davis's concept that movement building must be global and movement building must be intersectional. With that in mind, we've invited guests who have long understood the intersectionality of movements. We have activists from the black liberation struggle, from South Africa, from Colombia, across the world who are working not only only in their own communities around social justice, but have seen linkages with Palestine. So let me introduce our panelists. Our panelists are Kamal Franklin, who is a veteran organizer and lawyer, and one of the leaders of the Malcolm X grassroots movement, and one of the early delegates as a black liberation activist to Palestine. Also having joining us is Ahmed Abuznaid, who is a co-founder and legal policy director of Dream Defenders based in Florida, but has also brought together a recent delegation uh, to, to Palestine. From South Africa, joining us is Mohamed Desai, who is an organizer with BDS South Africa. Here I'd like to note uh, Sister Zanele uh, was supposed to join us, and we send her a shout out uh, as well as the other sisters that are working around BDS South Africa. And finally, we have Zoe Pepper Cunningham, who is in, based in Colombia and active in Jewish Voices for Peace, but is currently working around BDS Colombia. So the format of our program today will be that we'll make some introductory remarks. Um, we will then uh, open up to a moderated uh, Q&A, and um, also uh, we may at some point be joined by Frank Barat, who is an editor of the book with Angela Davis to share some of the thoughts. He's based in Brussels uh, and may share how the attack in Brussels and overall the political climate might change our politics around uh, Palestine. So I invite um, Kamal to speak around the history, the long history of solidarity with Palestine, his own work, uh, and also some um, remarks around the law. Thank you, Kamal. Thank you. Well, let me start by one, just thanking all of you guys for being here and inviting me. Uh, just for, uh, one note in the bio, I'm no longer with the Malcolm X grassroots movement, although I was with them for 18 years and was part of the movement, of course, when we went on the delegation. But just speaking about the, the history between the Palestinian and black struggle, it really goes back to a time in the 1960s uh, when third world liberation movements began breaking away from Western imperialism uh, with an ideological break from Western capitalism. Uh, and people like Malcolm X began framing the black liberation movement or the black freedom struggle as part of the world struggle against Western hegemony. Uh, and it began to catch on within the black movement circles, particularly young elements who began to represent later on the black power struggle. Um, and by 1965, we should say that this uh, this, the movement activity or organizing within the black community was actually the mainstream voice of the black community. It wasn't a sort of a marginalized uh, left or a, a radical voice that was looking to be heard in the larger black community. This really represented the mainstream of the community. And Malcolm himself uh, became sort of a figurehead or a pinpoint of starting that sort of unity between Palestinian organizations, particularly in meeting the PLO in 1964. 
uh, and penning a really important piece in the uh, Egyptian Gazette in 1964 uh, entitled uh, Zionist Logic. And that became sort of the springboard from which others started to really embrace and talk about and learn about the connections between the Palestinian struggle uh, and the black struggle here in the United States. Uh, and one last point on Malcolm is that uh, Malcolm not only saw the struggle through a prism of race and an ideology, but I actually remember that Malcolm was a practicing Muslim and saw kinship between fellow Muslims suffering and himself um, in the larger Muslim community, uh, particularly a kinship that saw Israel as part of the Western uh, block of uh, nations that were obviously trying to continue to take control over land and resources uh, from people of color. Um, and this, you know, the solidarity lasted post Malcolm's assassination in 1965. And in the era of black power, you had organizations like the Black Panther Party in particular, uh, who became sort of the leading black voice in movement circles, uh, who also expressed solidarity with the Palestinian struggle. You had uh, uh, the Algerian, the international section of the Black Panther Party meeting with Palestinians. You had uh, Huey Newton having personal meetings with Yasser Arafat. Um, and so this connection started burgeoning and became sort of a greater uh, part, again, of the movement struggle, inclusive of what we would consider to be more mainstream people uh, or mainstream groups like the CDC at the time uh, and Andrew Young, which really became become sort of the focal point of the diminishing of open solidarity between the black community and Palestinians, uh, particularly, let's say, in a mainstream or open way. Uh, as we remember, or some people remember, Andrew Young, who was the UN ambassador, met with Palestinian organizations, the PLO, uh, and expressed empathy with their cause. And as the UN ambassador in 1979, the tide was already turning around not only uh, anti-imperialist struggle, a radicalized black movement within the United States. And this led to his firing and also again becomes the sort of downfall of open solidarity particularly amongst mainstream black organizations and Palestinian organizations. Some of the last vestiges of that you know, were represented when Cynthia McKinney herself was a, a Georgia congresswoman who expressed solidarity with Palestinians. And through that solidarity, she was met with a challenger. And that challenger actually was funded by Israeli support groups that caused her demise in terms of her congressional seats uh, in the early 2000s. Um, and so today we see a new burgeoning of that, um, and some of that I, th I think uh, folks or organizations like the Malcolm X grassroots movement that worked in the spirit of Malcolm X can take some credit for at least trying to keep that part of the struggle, that part of the connection, that part of the solidarity alive. Um, and as we can see, uh, we did a trip, or we, we as the Malcolm X grassroots movement did a trip to Palestine, to West Bank and Gaza. Uh, we got to meet with uh, Palestinian officials. Uh, got to travel and see some of the destruction that's wrought on Palestinian communities. Um, and we met, we actually took the travel with larger organizations as part of a larger people of color movement um, group that went to Palestine. Uh, and we also uh, attempted to bring some relief through funds. Actually, one important part of that is that Most Def, a uh, famous hip hop artist, of course, actually raised funds for our trip and actually raised funds for us to give to the Red Crescent once we were there in Palestine. Um, and the purpose of our trip was, again, to keep with the solidarity of, of what was happening in Palestine and what's happening here in black America, uh, and in other, again, people of color organizations that also attended. And on our return, we did uh, many sort of report backs in different communities talking about that struggle. Uh, and we later, of course, um, we later helped support another delegation that went. And we also helped support uh, folks who came here to, uh, from Palestine to the United States to also talk about their individual organizations and the struggle in Palestine. Um, so, you know, that kind of uh, what now we call intersectionality, uh, back, but, you know, what, we, what used to be called just open solidarity, um, <laughs> is something that's been an important stream within the black liberation movement of struggle um, for now going on 50, 60 years. Um, and it's something that, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about, but uh, I think it's, 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 we're re-seeing it now in a really good, visible way, particularly through the, what social media allows us to see in ways that we couldn't see before. Um, but, but it's important, of course, that we lay that, found, that, that, that foundation of knowing that this, um, as you stated earlier, that this sort of solidarity goes back 
uh, a long time. I'll stop there. Wait, um, Wait um, I just want to add a little add bit, a little bit about, about, about sort of how post-9-11 uh, um, laws and policies uh, might have impacted solidarity. You mentioned earlier um, elected officials, Cynthia McKinney, was supportive, but we know, you know, having heard the uh, presidential candidate hopefuls talk at APAC that consistently they have said that uh, any effort towards solidarity towards Palestine will be thwarted. So it seems like there's actually a you know political change. So if you can just briefly talk about the the legal contribution of that change as an attorney activist. Sure. Um, I mean, what's happened post 9/11 is that solidarity has been criminalized, basically, uh, and that. It, you know, when you express solidarity, you have to be careful, very careful, because expressing solidarity uh, with certain groups or organizations uh, that at one point was just considered free speech can now be considered uh, actually act actively supporting terrorism. Um, and these kind of laws have tried to chill solidarity. They've tried to stop people from open, openly expressing uh, their support for Palestine. And as we, we spoke about a few seconds ago, within mainstream uh, sort of uh, uh, black elite political circles, um, they've gone over to the other side using uh, sort of not only the pretext of these laws, but now what we would be considered sort of the ideological vacuum that's been created by folks rushing post 9-11 to be anti-Muslim, anti-Palestine. Um, they've just left this vacuum and people have felt that they don't no longer have the space legally ideologically, movement-wise, until very recently, I would say, to really begin to be out there with their solidarity in a way that hasn't happened before. Great. Um, so I want to welcome uh, all of our uh, registrants and participants. We actually have activists from a wide range, um, including um, BDS India. So I just want to acknowledge uh, that though our panelists are catalysts to the conversation, this is a collective conversation. If you're tweeting, tweet at hashtag law at margins. I'd like to invite Ahmed um, to continue in terms of Dream Defender's work uh, and his own uh, work around you know, bringing a delegation to Palestine uh, and work uh, in terms of uh, um, bringing racial justice issues to the UN. So it's a lot, but um, welcome, Ahmed. Hey, thank you, Chantoli. Uh, thank you, Law at the Margins. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, thank you to Kamau. Honestly, it feels really good and refreshing to be able to follow up Kamau after that historical um, introduction of this uh, solidarity we've seen. Uh, I, I've told Kamau when we met previously that these are things that I began to educate myself on after having engaged in the work organically. So uh, I think it's affirming that we realize that there's a history behind these struggles that we're connecting. And so we're not alone. Uh, we're connected and we're going to win together. Um, I, I have the fortunate opportunity to serve an organization called the Dream Defenders. We were born after the murder of Trayvon Martin in Sanford, Florida. Uh, we engaged with a group of college students and community members from across the state of Florida to respond with direct action um, and civil disobedience by leading a march from Daytona Beach at a historic blue black college and university called Bethune Cookman all the way into Sanford into the belly of the beast where we then engaged in a civil disobedience by blocking the doors of the Sanford Police Department. And the statement of Dream Defenders was clear in that if these people could not do their jobs and arrest a murderer like George Zimmerman, uh, then they had no business being open, uh, especially operating within our tax dollars. And that was, the, that was really the start of Dream Defenders. So we have become a space for youth of color in the state of Florida and across the country to voice a dissatisfaction with the status quo domestically and abroad, and not only that, but some alternative ways forward. Um, and so we very uh, much so are proud of the, the fact that we offer folks alternate institutions, alternate forms of education and political analysis, and alternate routes for change. Uh, so the Dream Defenders are, uh, again, a direct action group um, out of the state of Florida, born out of the tragedy of Trayvon Martin's murder. Um, being one of the co-founders of the organization and being Palestinian, um, naturally, these were conversations that we started to have as an organization. Even in, in the initial founding um, march where we went to Sanford, I had on a kafiya uh, the whole time. Um, and we engaged in conversation because folks either had some form of knowledge 
or were interested in, in gaining some form of knowledge on the struggle of Palestine. And so we engaged in these conversations and, and one thing led to another and we thought it would be dynamic if as an organization that proclaims to um, be in solidarity with black and brown youth in the state of Florida and abroad, um, what would it look like uh, to take a delegation? And of course, as Kamal said, we were inspired by um, the Malcolm X's and we were inspired by the Huey Newtons and the Black pa Panther Party delegations and the Malcolm X grassroots movement delegations because we understood the impact. We knew that these delegations weren't uh, a vacation um, or an escape for folks from um, you know, the, the mundane day-to-day uh, -day of their lives. This was a transformative experience for people and we knew that because everyone who came back had something to say that was empowering um, and powerful. And so we knew that uh, based on um, my connection to Palestine and based on you know the brand of Dream Defenders, we can make it happen. We reached out to some partners and we were able to secure a delegation. Now what was interesting is we were initially supposed to go in August um, of 2014. Um, but if we all remember that summer was the latest assault and massacre on Gaza. And so naturally folks who were helping to fund the delegation and helping to um, allow us to bring all these folks together were a bit weary about sending folks to uh, Palestine in a time where um, there was massacres, there was mass upheaval, there was demolitions, and there was just really general unrest. So we ended up having to uh, push the delegation back a few months. But you know, the universe um, really conspires around uh, this movement at times. And what happened was um, the tragedy of Ferguson struck. And uh, again, through a sense of tragedy, folks were united. And so Michael Brown's street laying in the body for four hours called these youth activists in, Baltimore, uh, in Ferguson, I'm sorry, to, uh, to, to enact an uprising. And it was beautiful, and we all loved it, and, and we followed it, and we supported it. And, and folks from Palestine also followed it and supported it. And so there was a natural connection then being established between folks on the ground in Ferguson being shot at with tear gas and the, the folks in Palestine who undergo that treatment uh, under the Israeli occupation. So, so naturally then we had to rethink the delegation. We were thinking initially, you know, Florida-based Dream Defenders and a couple of folks from outside, but nothing major. And then we, we started to rethink this delegation. We were like, well, someone from Ferguson or a couple people from Ferguson have to be there. And of course we saw the tragedy of Eric Garner and so we thought the same with folks from New York who were working on the Eric Garner tragedy, you know, and then these are tragedies that not only um, parallel uh, systems but also these actual specific injustices. We have heard Palestinians yell, I cannot breathe, and we have heard black Americans yell, I cannot breathe. We have seen bodies of Palestinians laying on the ground for hours as we have seen the bodies of African Americans here laying on the ground for hours. And so you know, we wanted to take the next step um, in us understanding together these complexities um, and these parallels. And so we had this amazing delegation. It was beautiful. We got a chance to visit folks in 48 and in 67. Um, and there were lifelong bonds being built. And so the, the Dream Defenders Palestine delegation to this day um, embraces each other as a collective and a coalition. And we work hand in hand with those groups, Black Lives Matter, Hands Up United, Justice League NYC to this day. And Coincidentally, we're in, the ha we're, we're in the act of planning the next delegation, so we're really excited for that one. Um, we think it'll be just as transformative. We think it'll be just as powerful. Well, the Dream Defenders' work around Palestine also really connects to our greater belief in internationalism and intersectionality, as it was alluded to. Uh, we, we fervently believe that we'll win together, and we fervently believe that these same oppressors are not um, just connected by name and corporation, but, uh, but systems. Um, but, and brutality, and brutality that we can learn to fight uh, against together. And so uh, we really view that our, our work at the United Nations connects directly to our work in Palestine. You know, Malcolm X was big on solidarity internationally, was also, um, you know, an advocate for taking the case of African Americans to the United Nations. And I don't think it's because Malcolm thought the UN was going to give us uh, justice in this country or abroad, but it was that we would leave no stone unturned in our quest, in our search for justice. And so similarly to uh, Malcolm, we've advocated at the UN for, um, you know, folks struggling understand your ground laws and police brutality in this country. You know, folks like, um, you know, Jordan Davis um, and Trayvon Martin who, you know, are not given justice in the court of law because of these institutional practices and, and policies. 
Um, so we, we definitely would advocate for policy reformation, but we know that that's just a stepping stone. And so we have to keep pushing further until the whole system is dismantled, until we can see a collective liberation for people at the margins of the margins, um, at all of the intersections. You know, um, just a personal shout out to the intersections. You know, we have people here who struggle under different identities. If you're Muslim in the U.S., you're struggling right now. I think if you're African American, you're struggling. If you're Latino, you're undocumented. But there are people that exist at the margins of the margins. And so the, the case of our three brothers recently in Indiana, where you had three Muslim brothers um, of African or origin um, who were being tackled by the same system of hatred and Islamophobia and xenophobia that affects us daily here and affects our foreign policy abroad. So I think it's important with Dream Defenders um, that when we talk about intersectionality and internationalism that we also leave no, no stone unturned um, in advocating for the communities that, that sometimes do not have a voice. Um, I think that's, that's all for now for me. I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Ahmed. Um, I do want to just follow up on one uh, question. I know that um, you've written an op-ed on this. Um, there's been uh, a movement at the state level to uh, either name or censor activists are working around uh, Palestinian issues. Uh, you know, the funding cut in New York uh, in part was due to retaliate against students for justice in Palestine. Um, can you speak to some of these legal maneuvers that are being used I mean, you know, in part to break the solidarity, uh, and you can share what's happening specifically, you know, in Florida. Sure. So what we're seeing is that you know, folks engaged in the solidarity movement around Palestine are being attacked from several different angles, um, and one of those angles is as BDS activists. And so, folks who are supporting BDS have not not only seen pushback on college campuses, but now we're seeing statewide legislation, actually nationwide legislation in several states. Um, to push back against BDS and what does it mean? In Florida we've had several bills. One is a resolution that is strictly condemning uh, BDS and so it's basically equating BDS with anti-Semitism which is a consistent struggle and battle for folks engaged in solidarity with Palestine. Even our Jewish sisters and brothers are are levied with this um, this allegation. Um, and, but then more more powerful I think than the resolution is there's a bill that just passed and the, the governor of, of Florida, Rick Scott, I believe should be signing it soon, hopefully not signing it, but what, what it would create was a, would be an effective uh, demonization of all companies or corporations or organizations who support BDS. And so let's say uh, you have a, a small business, or maybe a minority owned business and you get statewide contracts, maybe you're a building contractor and you say you know, we're going to support BDS and we're not going to use Caterpillar products. Well, then the state of Florida would give you an opportunity to backtrack on that, uh, to apologize for that. And if so, um, then you would be allowed to continue receiving funding from the state. But if not, uh, your, your company would then be put on a list uh, where you would be effectively banned from receiving statewide funding um, for your business. And so they're very, uh, you know, eff effective and powerful means thereby, whereby they're trying to use policy to attack us. But I've seen you've seen groups like Palestine Legal and Center for Constitutional Rights offer, offer legal support directly to not only activists on the campuses and in the communities, but also folks engaged in these larger larger battles around BDS. I will say that also it's a political battle that I think we're going to see some movement on. In the state of Florida, we've seen one senator stand up against this anti-BDS um, type of legislation. His name is Dwight Bullard, and I think he's going to continue to shape um, a space where legislators can come forward and have effective communication and discussion on these policies. Even folks behind closed doors who had to support it um, were, were frustrated, but I think they're, they're, um, they're becoming a little bit uh, uh, communicative and open about their frustration with the Israeli lobby because I think all Americans should be fearful of how these anti-BDS pieces of legislation affect our rights to free speech and freedom of assembly. Thank you. Great, thank you. So um, thanks to both Kamal and Ahmed for giving sort of a rich and deep history in terms of black liberation struggle um, globally in the United States and the deep bonds with uh, Palestine. I want to shift and bring in um, Mohammed Desai, to, uh, who is with BDS South Africa, um, who, which we all know uh, Palestine and South Africa also share a deep bond in terms of solidarity. Um, to share a little bit about that history and then also the work that you're engaged in. So thank you and welcome. 
I'm deeply, deeply inspired uh, to be here and to be sharing this panel with others, those that are in the States, various parts of the United States, those from Colombia, involving various different struggles. Uh, it's deeply inspiring to be part of this panel and also generally when we from our different sectors come together to hear about how each other's struggles are so uh, similar, it's deeply motivating. So thank you so much. I'd like to start just with a short uh, story that uh, I, I have been told or I heard of uh, that really captures the meaning of solidarity and intersectionality. And that is the story uh, that I heard of uh, Rosa Parks. Uh, Rosa Parks, the famous civil rights uh, movement uh, leader, uh, spotted outside the apartheid South Africa embassy in the 80s. Um, she, together with other African Americans, spotted outside protesting against the apartheid South Africa. Journalists, members of the media, come up to her asking her, wanting to know from her, but but why? Why protest against something that's thousands of kilometers away on a completely different continent uh, that's affecting other people? And Rosa Parks uh, was, 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 was interrogated further to say that African Americans are facing issues here locally in the United States. Issues of discrimination, economic injustice, social struggles, etc. And Rosa Parks responded that you can chew gum and you can walk at the same time. You can fight local struggles and you can fight international struggles or stand in solidarity with international struggles at the same time. And this is really the task. This is a, really the task for all of us involved in whatever struggles we may find ourselves in. How do we find the capacity amongst us to be in solidarity with other struggles and with other, uh, and with other social justice uh, issues? And so being a South African, uh, we have had this potent gift of international solidarity in our struggle. We receive support from thousands, if not millions of people across the world. And so when we stand in solidarity with the people of uh, Cuba or the people of Palestine or the people of Western Sahara or Swaziland or whatever other struggling nation uh, that may be, we do it not, uh, not as a favor and not as charity, but as a duty, as a duty because of the deep sort of friendship and internationalism and solidarity that we received. But when it comes to the Palestinian people, and I've said this before when I was in the States, that when it comes to the Palestinian people, we do it definitely not out of charity because it was the Palestinian people that long before it became fashionable or sexy, it was the Palestinian people who stood in solidarity with us South Africans. It was the Palestinian people that provided us with arms, with resources, with diplomatic support all across the world. And so when we stand in solidarity with the Palestinian people, it's really not about a favor, it's really not about charity, but it's really about a deep connection that we have with the, with the people of Palestine. And I think that this this connection that we have as struggling nations, whether it's South Africans or whether it's African Americans in the United States, Palestinians, we need to nourish, we need to nourish and we need to nurture the solidarity. Because the because oppressive society or oppressive nations, the elites out there, have their own solidarity going on. And we and we realize this, whether it's African American issues in the United States or the Palestinian issue in the United States, we often find for example, G4S security being, being complicit in both issues. And so there's a need and necessity for us and an urgency, in fact, for us to reconnect the solidarity that used to exist before on a much grander scale at an international level. And so it's deeply uh, inspiring to hear about the kind of work that is being done by the Malcolm X grassroots movement or Dream Defenders and other such organizations in the United States that the sparks of solidarity are beginning to flow between the different sort of uh, struggles. And so this is really just a, um, a background and a context as to our solidarity efforts uh, from South Africa. But something that we find fascinating in South Africa is how you folks in the United States, or those that are based in the United States, how you're obsessed and almost, and, and, and very knowledgeable, and I don't mean this necessarily in a negative way, but you all are really clued up with UN resolution, what, what, and United Nations uh, resolution, this, this, and this law, and that law. 
And for us, when it comes to solidarity, it's not about these technicalities. Mm. It's about a deep connection that we have as human beings across the across our various countries, whether it's our sisters or brothers in Colombia, or whether it's our sisters and brothers in the United States, or whether it's in Palestine or in, or in any other place. It's more often than not when we speak at events in South Africa, at workshops and at programs, it's about where's a picket line and show me where to stand. What is to be boycotted? Tell me how to boycott it. It's not about questioning. Uh, it's not about questioning. Yes, of course, there are times and places where interrogation must be made, but that should be done internally, if possible, and thereafter uh, public, if uh, if internal sort of discussion cannot take place. But this is something that in South Africa, I think that we have uh, that we're very grateful for that there still exists a a humanity that finds itself connected uh, to others. And this is really the, the, at the heart of intersectionality. It's about how do we, from our different struggles, Samora Machel, uh, the, the former president who was assassinated from Mozambique, he spoke about how solidarity is about the same struggles being fought in different uh, terrains. And it's really this uh, that's at the heart of intersectionality. How do we, in our various methods, in our various ways, in our own uh, struggles, how do we create a world that's kinder and that's more just towards Palestinians, that's more just I don't know if we lost um, Mohammed for a second. Mohammed, right at the key point. <laughs> Let's wait for a bit. Let's see. Okay. Um, it's possible that. Um, and since I'm seeing uh, Mohammed frozen <laughs> at a pivotal point, that um, since he is calling in from, I believe Johannesburg, that uh, there might be a pause. So I'm gonna, uh, we're gonna look into that <clears throat> and have uh, Mohammed continue. But um, what I like to do is uh, perhaps uh, ha in, at this moment invite Zoe to start, uh, and then we can re, uh, in our sort of Q&A, um, have Mohammed to sort of uh, talk a little bit more. But a couple of things I just wanted to highlight, and the reasons why Lot the Margins is really uh, invested in having uh, not only US-based uh, activists, but activists from um, outside of the United States, and particularly the consider the Global South, because I think to Mohammed's point is that sometimes we do have uh, a bit of myopia because we're sort of within the terrain in which we, we work. So um, uh, bringing in Zoe, uh, and again I want to uh, acknowledge that we have a number of registrants and listening who are active around Palestinian solidarity and community activists. Um, so we do have actually listeners who are uh, engaged in this work. Uh, so Zoe, uh, tell us a little bit about your work in Colombia, uh, and just a clarification: you're a Colombian-based activist, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and so we'll 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 clarify that. Um, so thank you, Zoe, for joining us. Cool. Um, yeah, just to start off, my name is Zoe Pepper Cunningham. Um, I'm actually from Boston, <laughs> Massachusetts, um, but I'm speaking on behalf of my collective, which is BDS Colombia. Um, yeah, so I'm, I work in Colombia in an organization called La Red de Hermandad y Solidaridad con Colombia. It's an international solidarity organization, which is a network of international collectives that work in solidarity with Colombian organizations. Um, and being in Colombia, I obviously, when I arrived here, I, I looked for the BDS collective organization where I could get involved in Colombian solidarity work. Um, BDS Colombia is a collective that was founded about four years ago. It was started by two friends, and then kind of in the past couple of years, we've grown. Right now, we're about 15 people from different political tendencies, from different organizations. Um, the majority of the people who work in BDS Colombia are also active in other um, social, political organizations within Colombia. Um, intersectionality and international solidarity is at the center of our work in BDS Colombia. Um, Colombia, as many know, 
has been in an armed conflict for over 60 years. Um, as from BDS Colombia, we believe that the liberation and pursuit of justice in Colombia and the end of the social, political, and armed conflict is directly linked to the liberation and pursuit of justice of the Palestinian people. The Colombian government, like Israel, is one of the governments that receives millions of dollars in military aid from the U.S. government. Um, similarly to what happens to the Palestinian people in, in occupied territories in Gaza, um, the, Colum the U.S. military aid has had cat catastrophic impacts on the human rights of the Colombian people. Just to give one example, um, in the late 2000s, um, there was a scandal called the False Positives when the U.S. when U.S. trained gov um, Colombian Army battalions killed Colombian youth and dressed them up as guerrilla combatants to be able to deliver um, results in the war on terror. This scandal is called the False Positive Scandal, and recently it's been uncovered that many of the battalions that were implicated in the scandal were trained by the U.S. government, by the U.S. Army. Um, so it's pretty intrinsic, this liberation in Colombia and the liberation in Palestine, because on the other hand, <laughs> the Israeli government has also had a heavy hand in the conflict um, and has actually worked against um, kind of gaining peace in Colombia. Um, Israeli generals and soldiers have often been sent to Colombia to train the Colombian army officials and in one example of Yair Klein, who is an um, Israeli lieutenant, I'm pretty sure, he was actually implicated in being in training Colombian paramilitaries. Colombian paramilitaries, um, <laughs> for those who don't know, have been uh, present in Colombia, very active in the 90s in human rights violations against community activists, social activists, um, small peasants, Afro-Colombians, indigenous people. Basically, they've been they're the extra legal force of the Colombian government to pursue um, land grabs, um, maintain control over the territory, over the drug shipping routes. And so this kind of direct connection between the Israeli army, the Israeli government, the U.S. government, and Colombian government makes it really important that our, the intersectionality is at the basis um, of our movement. Currently, we're involved in a campaign against the ratification of a tr free trade agreement between Colombia and Israel, um, an agreement which we see as a direct threat to Colombian civil society and the pursuit of peace, because currently, we, did, we actually just finished an analysis of the imports in Colombia from Israel, and the majority of the imports are from the military sector. <laughs> Many would kind of assume that Israel is a specialist in military um, products in security equipment, in arms, in fighter jets, in any sort of, in all that sort of general sector of military um, production. That's where Colombia is importing um, the majority of the goods from Israel. And so we see this free trade agreement as a huge threat to the pursuit of peace in Colombia. Right now, Colombia is in the midst of a historic peace process with the guerrilla group FARC. Um, liber Anyway, with the FARC, which is uh, Fuerzas Armadas Revolución. Uh, military products when they're in the midst of a peace process. Okay. Um, another major component of this free trade agreement is from the agro-industrial sector. Um, Colombia is a very rural country. There's a huge population of small peasants. And so when the agro-industrial sector is growing in, in Colombia by importing products from Israel, by import, importing seas, by importing um, irrigation equipment, that's a direct threat to the Colombian peasants who are fighting against kind of the, the industrialization of the agricultural sector. Um, so all of these issues means that... Um, intersectionality is really at the basis. We work with um, a lot of different Colombian civil society organizations um, in all of our campaigns because, for example, in this free trade agreement, the people who are impacted are the, are the small peasants, are the social organizations that are impacted by militarization. Um, something that was really interesting when I first came to Colombia is how similar it looks to Palestine, to the West Bank, to Gaza, because you're in the countryside and you see military tanks. You see 
um, checkpoints. You see military everywhere, and you're thinking, but this is, <laughs> they're fighting against their own people. You're not, they're not, it's like an occupation within their own country. <laughs> so really, it's kind of, it's very, it's very striking that, um, and I think a lot of people have had that same um, experience where they're like, wow, this is, this is a militarized state against their own people. Um, so for us, really, um, all of those connections that are that exist on the institutional level and the state level are important for us to combat. So we've been working. We have now. I think in in three weeks, there's going to be a visitor from Palestine, from South Africa, um, who will be um, working with us to meet with the different civil society or civil society organizations. Um, to talk about the free trade agreement, to talk about a lot of different campaigns we have, and to make those connections on the grassroots level, on the organizational level, so that we're also connecting. Um, because we know it's, we can't just like stand by and watch the Israeli government try to um, help out the militarization in Colombia, help out the oppression of people in Colombia, well, and, do, and ask for do, to do nothing. Um, yeah, I think um, it's the context in Colombia is interesting. Um, there isn't, well, you see in the U.S. and I think in South Africa also a really strong Zionist lobby, a Zionist lobby that has a, wrong, a strong um, basis in traditional Jewish institutions. In Colombia, we don't have as much of that. <laughs> there's a very small, first of all, there's a small Jewish population, and second of all, um, the Zionist lobby comes a lot more from the Christian sectors and then also mm. from the, the same government. So we don't have as much of that pushback, um, but the issue is that most people are kind of focused on ending the war, focused on ending the armed conflict. So kind of our biggest struggle is making people see those connections and see that it's important because, for example, right now, there's going to be a huge... Um, the, the free trade agreement is with the, is with the Israeli government, and so we need to w work um, with those organizations that are also working against the war, against the armed conflict to be able to like solidify that solidarity. I think that's probably one of the biggest challenges we have. Um, but at the same time, right now, the Israeli ambassador has been writing a bunch of um, columns in the newspapers calling our organization terrorists, support anti-Semitics, <laughs> and you know, all of the, sort of the same sort of things that you find in the U.S. and South Africa. But for us, it's been a bit slower for that to pick up because there's not as much of a lobby. Um, I think I'll leave it there if there are any questions. And sorry, I usually talk about this in Spanish, so it's a little, it's always a little difficult for me to change the language, so I apologize for that. No. Uh, well, <clears throat> my dream is one day that we'll have a, actually a Spanish um, uh, webinar, and uh, so awesome. uh, Albert Garcia, <laughs> who is our wonderful tech producer, is working on how to do that. Um, so then we'll cool. bring you on. I do want to, uh, uh, Mohammed was speaking at the most impassioned moment, uh, yeah. and as internet is, uh, I'd like him to kind of continue, and I'd like um, Kamal and Alma to think about this uh, issue that Zoe raises, which is the globalization of militarization, right? And what we saw in Ferguson in the United States, the training of Israeli intelligence and army, um, so, you know, in terms of the powers that be are connected, they're intersecting and they're, so, you know, showing solidarity. And so I think that, that you know, we also need to sort of acknowledge that. Um, so we're going to talk on a shift to the challenges of solidarity, right? Law being one, but also the increased militarization and criminalization. Um, and then with that, I do want to have Mohammed sort of uh, uh, complete his initial thoughts. Um, and if you could add uh, this notion of terrorism, because we know that uh, Mandela was uh, up until I think the 90s uh, was listed as a um, terrorist under U.S. Uh, watch list, and so, but how does that term have changed post 9/11? Is that impacted at all? Um, you know, the work that you do in South Africa. But again, I'd like to invite Mohammed to. Um, Mandela did not go to prison as one of our board members at BDS South Africa often reminds us he didn't go to prison for selling little cupcakes at a tea party. He went to prison because he was a soldier. He went to prison because he was an armed soldier of an armed revolution. And so I think that the idea of armed struggle is something that sometimes 
offend some sensitivities amongst the Palestinian solidarity movement. Now, I may be opposed personally to violence. Uh, I may be opposed to the death of any human being, but it is the right of South Africans or Colombians or the Palestinians, if they wish to do so, to defend themselves using arms. And so this, this idea that of Mandela being this favorite uncle of everybody, uh, we must tap a little bit deeper. Uh, Mandela was also a revolutionary, and this is the Mandela that we must bring out in our with struggles because Mandela, as in, in, in addition to any sort of hero, whether it's Malcolm X or whether it's Martin Luther King or any sort of leader of any movement, they are often ca captured post their death. They are often captured and co-opted into another narrative and you must defend against this. You must defend against this by celebrating the lives of those that we find uh, dear, of those that we find revolutionary. I won't be very long, but I would like to just tap or just uh, talk a bit about uh, the PDS movement locally in South Africa, um, because I do think that it's interconnected to, um, to, to the other PDS chapters. And I think it's important for us to celebrate our achievements. Uh, it's important for us to, uh, to celebrate uh, the gains that we have made in all of our different uh, struggles. We are getting somewhere. We're not just screaming out at a at a blank uh, wall. We are actually chipping away and it is actually possible to live in a better, more peaceful and more just world. Live, uh, being part of the Palestine Solidarity Movement in South Africa, we've witnessed uh, major and significant victories in terms of Palestine Solidarity. You have the University of Johannesburg in 2011 that became the first university in the world to terminate relations uh, with the Israeli regime. We have one of our biggest and largest agricultural companies called Carsten Farms after a three-year campaign that ended its relations with an Israeli cooperative called Hadi Klein. But probably most significantly, is the National Executive Committee, the highest decision-making body of our ruling party, the African National Congress, taking two significant resolutions in 2014. The first resolution was for a full and complete travel ban for any minister, any deputy minister, any government official, any member of parliament, any government uh, administrator at any level to the state of uh, Israel. And the second resolution that was taken by the highest decision-making body of our ruling party was that any company, whether Israeli, international, or South African, that's involved in any sort of illegal Israeli activity, be that settlement activity or involvement in occupied Palestinian territories, to be barred and to be denied any South African government tender or contract. And so in some ways, the BDS movement in South Africa has its basis, yes, among students and among civil society, but at the same time, it's also about how do we push government sanctions against the Israeli regime. But I should mention that uh, some of you may find some of the victories coming, off, uh, coming out of South Africa as important or as significant, but we more often than not wonder what are we not doing, uh, what are we not doing right because we are deeply inspired by the Presbyterian Church or the Methodist Church or the United Church of Christ in the United States ending its relations with Israeli-linked companies or the kind of gains that have been made in Europe, in South America, Latin America and elsewhere. Great. Um, before <clears throat> I invite Kamal and uh, Ahmed, I do want to give Frank Barat, who you can uh, see on the screen, who is the editor with Angela Davis on the book Freedom is a Constant Struggle. Uh, Ferguson, Palestine, and Foundations of a Movement, to briefly say some words. Um, the book, as you may have heard at the outset, was the, um, the catalyst and the frame, uh, framing for this conversation, intersectionality movements, the importance of globalizing our struggle, but then organizing locally. So Frank uh, is also, I believe, uh, based in Brussels, has re recently written a really great piece about uh, not sort of pandering to fear and how that might also have an impact broadly, not only in Muslim Americans, um, in Europe and the United States and globally, but also, I think, um, around sort of solidarity movements. So, Frank, do you, if you'd like to just say a few words and then we'll... Um... Okay. Um, hi, yeah. hi, everybody. Um, nice, nice to be part of, the, of this uh, hangout. Hi, Mohammed. It's, it's been a while. Nice to see your, your face again. Uh, um, yeah, so um, the I mean the idea of the book was um, really came bef because as a, as a solidarity activist with uh, Palestine and, and various others uh, sort of social struggles, 
um, you know, as, we, as we've seen now, we, uh, I, mean, I kept asking myself, you know, and like Mohammed said, what are we missing? You know, why, why is, is, um, is the movement, uh, I mean, in a way, like, yeah, the movement has grown um, amazingly in terms of, you know, with the BDS goal and in, in the last 10 years. But I think we are now at sort of um, at, at, at the crossroad, you know, at a, a juncture where we either, you know, go the extra mile or we, we sort of stall as, as a movement. And so the BDS movement has achieved something pretty extraordinary in the last 10 years. But now we need to, you know, to go the extra sort of the extra gear. And uh, so, so the issue was, was, was how to sort of bring all the movements together. And I thought that, you know, talking about this with Angela Davis that has, you know, that is involved in so many, you know, different movements and that has the sort of the wisdom and the, and the experience of so many struggles was, um, was very important. And, um, and, and what's happened in Brussels, what, three days ago now, is also a proof that, I don't know about you guys, and it might be a bit just weird to say that, but every time something like this happens, like, uh, like you know, in, in Paris or in Beirut or in, 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 in Turkey or whatever, but I mean, I live in Europe, so I mean, the, the Paris attacks and the, and the Belgium one sort of hit me harder. Every time it happens, I feel that, as an activist, or as activists, we have also failed. This is proof that you know, we're not doing, um, you know, there's something we're missing. Because if those youth and stuff are, uh, in a way, instead of you know being part of the movement and stuff, just blowing themselves up, is that it's that you know our work needs to be broader, and we need to reach those to those people as well. And um, and it's um, it's a tough one, but I think we have to we have to sort of think about it and and do it. Um, and yeah, so the sort of international inter inter intersectionality, sorry, of, of the movements are, are crucial. Um, and I think it goes both ways. You know, a, a lot of people, I was in Chile about a year ago and I went to Temuco, so near where the, uh, the uh, sort of uh, indigenous people of, of Chile, uh, and I'm sorry, but I just I can't think of the name. Um, can anyone, can someone help? And so can just continue, and then oh, yeah, you know. the Mapuche people. Yeah, sorry, yeah. So, my my bad. So the Mapuche people. And so I was talking to a few leaders of the Mapuche community and stuff, and they were telling me something that I think is, is key as well. That you know the Mapuche people talk about Palestine all the time, and they make the links between Palestine all the time, and they uh, and uh, and the links are pretty obvious with the Mapuche people as well as they are with the sort of Indian American uh, movement in the U.S. and uh, but when you see Palestine, I mean, sometimes the links are not made uh, on the Palestinian side. You know, it's not often that you hear Palestinians talking about the Mapuche, talking about the Indian Americans, talking about, uh, and it's changed now. You know, it's changing with Ferguson. And, but I think the links have to have to be solidified. And uh, and a lot of people see Palestine as, the, as this love, um, as sort of the main issue. But uh, but it's a, it's a it's a more broader uh, st struggle, and we have to address this as well. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll stop. I'll stop there. Great. Thank you so much for 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 Frank for for sharing that. So I do want to shift to. Um, I'm gonna return you back to the the participant. I'm sorry, but I'm gonna. Have, I'm just saying that I'm gonna have to go in five yes, minutes. Yes, that's sorry. fine. Sorry, yeah. um, so I do want to bring in Ahmed and uh, maybe Kamal to talk about this idea of militarization uh, and shared intelligence, um, and uh, you know I, I, how that might impact movement building um, and uh, the work that sort of moves ahead and how maybe there might be some differences from when you, you know, sort of began the solidarity work um, and then now. Uh, I, I don't mind starting, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I would say that um, some, an interesting point that Ma uh, Mohammed brought up from South Africa uh, is mixed in with this militarism, again, is that this connection between the United States, Europe, Israel, obviously is not new. This is an ongoing European enterprise uh, that supports European dominance and supports settler colonial states. Colonial states, um, and the network of how you keep that sort of dominance going, and then elites from local countries, is really the larger uh, 
fight or struggle that we're all talking about, right? It's these uh, uh, connected elites, these are connected nation states uh, based on sort of a European platform um, that have been doing this, uh, you know, for not only decades, but centuries. And so, you know, one example, of course, in more or sort of recent history is when the U.S. Uh, had to stop funding or giving military arms to South Africa, it turned to its friend Israel to fill that gap to give arms to the apartheid government of South Africa, and Israel did its job, right? Um, as an outpost in the Middle East of European imperialism, Israel gets the support it gets because it does its job of checking uh, Islamic uh, or Muslim countries, um, keeping a fair factor, um, and controlling land and resources that can be used for later European dominance. Um, and so even today as we talk about the militarization of the police on a local level, which comes from mutual trainings between Israeli forces, U.S. police departments, uh, European police departments, military security apparatus, th all, all we have now is a sort of a, a logical extension in their mind of what they've been doing for decades as technology increases the ability to increase so that the spying that takes place happens. Uh, they're improving how they deal and work with each other. Um, and we're always, because of the lack of resources we have, in a certain sense, playing catch up. Uh, one quick thing I want to also mention is that uh, I, I also feel that even though solidarity movements are obviously extremely important, I think the Palestinian issue is certainly an issue unlike South Africa uh, because of the demographic situation in South Africa at the time. Uh, Palestine is an issue that solidarity is extremely important, but I think obviously Palestinians notice themselves that this issue is first and foremost going to be solved by Palestinians with the support of the international community that can lend its support. Uh, the, the, the way in which this struggle is, is, is bearing out in terms of the shifting uh, demographics within Palestine itself, and I call all of it Palestine to be honest, um, that these, these shifting demographics um, and the resources and the type of struggle that the Palestinians themselves are currently in and will be in, which is a range of tactics, again, like Mohammed spoke about. They will be tactics which are around civil disobedience and nonviolent, but they will be tactics that definitely will include revolutionary tactics and struggles to defend themselves against a military occupation. Um, and those act within that framework somehow, some way, uh, Palestinians will be leading this struggle for freedom and it's up to us again to offer that support and to not waver in that support um, when things happen that the corporate media who use to support the same tactics um, when the military might of the United States or Europe or Israel is using those tactics but when several when, when tactics um, which involve violence are used by other peoples uh, those those tactics and I'm particularly talking about Palestine the Palestinian struggle are are used as a way to try to get most of us to stop supporting Palestinians. Great. Um, after uh, Ahmed's remark, I'm going to um, encourage folks uh, to pose your questions. Uh, we also have um, Awaz Islam from BDS India, um, and I uh, would like to have him sort of share the work that they're doing locally. Um, and the other thing that maybe Ahmed can speak to is BDS is not the sum total of Palestinian organizing and struggle. That's one tactic and one piece of it. So just uh, although we are talking about that, um, you know, maybe you can also speak to other ways in which movements are uh, showing solidarity or other tactics that are being used. Um, but so Ahmed. Sure, thank you. Well, I think Brother Kamal really laid it out um, properly for us um, in looking at militarization as um, a, a tactic, um, a, a another, um, you know, uh, I guess, attack in service of the greater fight against our movement. And so um, we know that we saw that in the streets of Ferguson, and we've seen it really historically in this country where police forces have been made to look like military occupying forces. Uh, we've seen it um, enhanced through the 1033 program that was recently um, re-evaluated due to a lot of the grassroots movement work on the ground. And so folks were pushing back against um, seeing police forces with, um, you know, military gear and, you know, and, and hopefully seeking an end to the programs that actually allow for local police forces to, you know, gain these, um, in, in these types of equipments and weapons. Um, of course, related is the training that these folks are getting in Israel. 
um, counterterrorism training, which they actually end up applying to protesters. You know, that's the times where we've seen it. Um, the counter, all the care, counterterrorism they've uh, training they've seen, um, and they've yet to, um, you know, kind of stop one of these, uh, you know, tragedies from striking us in movie theaters or in different areas here in the United States. And so I think that we realize that um, the threat is near and the threat is there for it to literally look like military occupations um, in communities. It has and it could continue to be. So we have to see folks continuing to push back on the local level. I think the important thing to realize is not only is their military might increasing and also being um, filtered into local police forces, but um, as Kamau alluded to, the surveillance uh, movement of today is huge. Uh, we're seeing you know, you just saw a presidential candidate like Ted Cruz call for um, actual patrols on Muslim neighborhoods across the country. Now, the reality is all Muslims know communities are already under surveillance. And so if they, if they surveil the mosques, if they surveil the local community gatherings, they're already in your neighborhoods. But I think what's, what's, um, what we're coming to grips with is that now they're publicly proclaiming it and feeling emboldened and empowered to say such things publicly because there's this air of xenophobia um, which allows for domestic policies um, like militarization of police to come into attack. Um, same thing with surveillance. Folks um, can uh, connect a foreign uh, threat, which they perceive to be ISIS, for instance. And now, for instance, you see on hit on right-wing hit pieces like Breitbart, Breitbart, where they're connecting uh, the Black Liberation Movement here and ISIS and Islamist uh, quote-unquote terrorist movements. And so we know that foreign policy and domestic policy go hand in hand. We have to have a pushback against this militarization and this surveillance. Um, to the second question around tactics, I think education is huge. There's a culture shift going on in the country right now, and it's because people are actually being educated on facts on the ground that they previously did not have to grapple with. And so when they say, well, what about a two-state solution, and they're being educated on the fact that the very land that folks claim to be a part of a future Palestinian state is evaporating by the day because of settlements illegal under international law. And so while BDS is a tactic, once folks have some, side, some sort of political education, we have to understand that the basis is that there's a political analysis and education that our folks need in this country that relates to our foreign policy abroad and how we interact with people all over the world. And so education and also cultural uh, organizing is huge. You know, when, when folks see the kafiya, it's important that they understand that the kafiya symbolizes something. Same, same with the debka, when you see community performances of, of the debka dance and, you know, festivals where Arabic and Middle Eastern food is portrayed. I think it's important that we utilize education and community organizing to bring folks to a, to a point where they actually, actually understand why BDS is necessary and why BDS has been the only way um, that, that a lot of us feel nonviolently has been able to accomplish a lot of goals recently. Great. So um, I want to encourage folks to um, uh, post their questions on the chat. You can also tweet your questions using hashtag law at margins. Um, there is a question to, um, to Mohammed from Suzanne Adderley. Um, and I actually want to acknowledge Suzanne, who is one of the contributors uh, and advisors to Law at the Margins and has been instrumental in, in conceiving this um, this program. Um, so Suzanne had asked um, about critique in the Daily Vox uh, on South Africa BDS. Um, she didn't give a link to the article, but perhaps she can link it on the chat feed. Um, but maybe you can give some context to the critique. Um, that's the question. And then next question is um, for Zoe. Uh, there's been a lot of co um, conversations around link of Afro-Colombian folks, indigenous folks, and Palestinian solidarity. And um, if you can speak a little bit more about that, uh, and then I would add also whether the changes in U.S.-Cuba relations have any sort of impact. So I'm going to invite Mohammed, encourage folks to uh, ask questions. Uh, our webinar ends uh, promptly at 2. Uh, and so this is really the opportunity to ask questions. Um, so Mohammed. Sure. Thanks so much. Uh, so I'd like to touch on uh, perhaps uh, three things. The first is, um, first the Daily Vox article. This was a series of articles that were published at the height of Israeli Apartheid Week, which South Africa recently saw. Uh, we had, I think, just over 200 events across the country at various campuses and cities and towns. 
The articles were critical. Some questioned the timing as to why in the, in the, at the height of a campaign to release such uh, criticism. But I think that we must be far more humble as activists and as leaders of movements, uh, leaders of campaigns, that we don't have all the answers. We sometimes slip up and we mess up. And the whole point, however, is how do we become smarter, stronger, and more strategic organizations? And so we must welcome uh, criticism. This must be the starting point. This, the, the, the second thing that I'd like to uh, touch on is I think that we must unapologetically, we must unapologetically be anti-homophobia, we must be anti-racist, we must be anti uh, any sort of uh, anti-Zionist, whatever the case may be. We must be unapologetic about this. Uh, that we're not here to to bring people around the table and to hear the, how they're offended by this and that. No. Uh, our duty is to speak truth to power in, uh, in some ways. But, however, and this is something that I'd like to insert, is that we must ensure that our activism, our campaigning is also grounded in love. A love for the a love firstly for ourselves and love then for the other human being. Because once our solidarity, our campaigning, or our activism is grounded in love, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't be angry. I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't hate certain uh, certain ideologies or certain uh, issues. But if we ground it in love, I think that in many ways we've already won the battle. We've already won. Uh, they've already lost the battle, and it's just about winning the larger war. And, I mean, look, there's a lot of criticism around uh, the person that I'm just about to quote. I'm not saying that I support his uh, ideas uh, or not. Um, just, uh, just the point that I want to make is that uh, Gandhi's idiom about uh, first, they, uh, first they mock you, uh, then they, uh, first they ignore you, then they mock you, then they uh, fight you, and then you hopefully, uh, well, win. Uh, this is currently where we see ourselves in, I think at least, in the BDS uh, movement. The Zionist lobby, both in South Africa, in the USA, in the UK, and many other countries, the Zionist lobby, the Israeli lobby, is fighting us like never before. This is, on the one hand, a reflection on the strength and the sort of gains that the movement has made, but this is also really the most testing time that we are going to be going through. When we have this onslaught of capital, when we have this collusion with in the political arena, the question is, can we keep this activism uh, going? Can we keep our campaigning going? And hopefully this would lead to, uh, to uh, various victories that will then uh, follow thereafter. Great. So, um, so Zoe, to your question, uh, just a, a, a postscript, Suzanne uh, mentions that the reason she asked is because it seems that as solidarity movements gain strength and uh, broad-based support, it seems that Zionism and Zionist institutions are also gaining support. And so we're probably going to see, and this is my part adding, a greater uh, retaliation and challenges, which it seems to, uh, even more important for us to be um, unapologetic and um, really sort of grounding our organizing work. So Zoe, I think a really fascinating, uh, sorry, Mohammed, was there something you wanted to add? Yeah. Well, to answer Suzanne, I mean, Look, the, the anti-apartheid movement can't be blamed for the deaths of our people here in South Africa. It was the apartheid regime. It was always the apartheid government. Our activism was a response. If the apartheid regime became more fierce, if racism became more prevalent, it was a response to. It wasn't as a result of the anti-apartheid movement. And likewise, we're going to see an increase of Zionism. We're going to see more Israeli flags. But this, in many ways, is a reflection of the strength of the movement and the gain of the movement. I'll Great. stop it. Um, so, Zoe, um, there was a conversation around um, Afro-Colombian solidarity. Um, you know, what are you seeing? We're seeing. Um, and I also just want to acknowledge Val Merlina, who is also a second-year law student, as well as a um, uh, intern with Lot the Margins this spring uh, talks about other occupied uh, communities, uh, talks about the Northern Ireland example or something. So I'm just mentioning these as uh, chats from our uh, registrants. So Zoe, afro colombian um, solidarity with Palestine. Um, maybe you can unmute. Oh. Yeah. Sorry, great. Go ahead. Oh yeah, you just did it. Okay, cool. Um, so in Colombia, we're we're currently the only BDS-focused organization, um, BDS Colombia. But 
from a lot of different organizations. Um, a lot of different organizations have like a political orientation of supporting Palestinian solidarity struggles. Um, this could mean um, uh, writing communi communiques, like when there's a bombing, when um, doing a rally, when there's um, something happening in Gaza, when there's something happening in the West Bank. Um, a lot of organiz there, in terms of like na um, processes of Afro-Colombians, I would say that Marcha Patriotica, um, Processes de Comunidades Negras, which is two um, national organizations that have um, that have like a national focus, but have often showed solidarity with the Palestinian struggle. Um, kind of this direct, it's there's a big challenge in Colombia to be able to like show the solidarity, to be able to like go to Palestine, go on delegations, because we're in Colombia, people barely have money to like make their own things happen within Colombia. So um, people, there's been a lot of shows of solidarity with Palestine, but mainly um, kind of just like doing actions when they can, writing articles, but in terms of um, a dedicated campaign from these different organizations, a lot of articulate to our, um, to our campaigns, but um, there hasn't been like a consolidated um, campaigns from these organizations, but a lot of organizations kind of have a basis support Palestine, um, write about Palestine, always acknowledge Palestinian struggle, um, but direct campaigns, um, none that I know of right now. <laughs> yeah. Great. Um, so we weren't able to bring on Awaz Islam from uh, BDS India. I don't believe he's on a, a webcam, but um, he does share uh, that in India, because um, there are in India is also uh, a colonizing uh, uh, state, uh, particular to Kashmir, um, so that that when we are organizing locally in communities that are, I think um, Ahmed had said this, you know, margins of the margins, um, mm -hmm. that it brings up particular uh, challenges. I do wanted to uh, mention that uh, comment in the chat. Um, so I want to encourage folks to, uh, we're going to slowly wind down to ask uh, questions. Um, there is one question that's come up, which is really particular about um, the Palestinian Authority and uh, whether or not um, the Palestinian um, political authority uh, is, uh, you know, how do we engage with, um, the, uh, with the authority or the sort of the political sort of leadership in movement building. So I don't know if anyone uh, feels comfortable to answer that uh, question. The question is, Palestinians can no longer differentiate between uh, Palestinian Authority and the occupation with the uh, corrupt political oligarchy where do you see Palestinian struggle without a legitimate legitimate leader so uh, I wasn't sure I usually know who to field a question to but this one I'm not sure so Mohammed <laughs> great thank you uh, yeah, I'll start off. Uh, I think that uh, it's an interesting time because the younger generation of Palestinians is certainly rejecting the PA, um, this, the, especially uh, Palestinians in the diaspora. I think they've lost faith in um, you know, the former PLO leadership, which has then transcended into being the PA. Uh, I think that um, we don't have to look for that one leader, though. I think that that's what I want to push back against, is looking for that legitimate leader, uh, the next Arafat or... Uh, another Mahmoud Abbas or anything, that's really not what's going to get us to liberation. I think we're having to think beyond uh, the status quo about what governance could look like and what liberation could look like for our people. And so I think it looks like supporting the grassroots efforts of um, whether it's Youth Against Settlements, whether it's uh, the folks in Deheshe and, uh, and the other refugee camps that are organizing around um, discussions around liberation, cultural liberation, who are talking about um, no two state, no one state, but what does just freedom look like in the sense of living? Um, and I think we have to, uh, again, push folks to have a vision of what could take us beyond the status quo. We know that uh, the, the routes that we've tried so far with Oslo and with the PA are not working. The issue that we have is we know the PA should dissolve. The issue is what does the transition look like? Um, a lot of those folks employed by the PA have, yes, become subcontractors for Israel's illegal occupation. But that means those are jobs and resources and families that are being supported by being uplifted through this structure. And we have to figure out a transition whereby 
Palestinians can reclaim their narrative, reclaim their, reclaim their independence, and actually have a sustainable life for our folks outside of these structures of the PA. Um, so I know that we don't have maybe a set organization to rally behind right now, um, but there are folks united around this collective vision of Palestinian liberation. We just have to figure out getting together what that exactly looks like, and then we can go out there and get it. And I don't think we need to look for one single uh, legitimate leader to get us there. Uh, really quickly, can I join in? Mm -hmm. or? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and so just to follow up, I think particularly for those of us who are doing solidarity work, we certainly should be picking and choosing and deciding on other folks' leadership. Um, I think, it, and again, particularly for those living within the United States um, uh, and other countries who are having dealings with Israel, there's enough work for us to do um, and for us to try to stop the states that we live in to do no harm to get out of the enterprise of funding um, basically a racist um, Zionist uh, occupation of Palestinian lands. Uh, it's enough for us to try to stop the military uh, exchanges and hardware that goes to Israel. We have enough work on our side to do in terms of convincing the American populace uh, to either stop playing a sort of middle don't care game or deciding with sort of a right wing religious uh, viewpoint of what Israel represents. We have enough work over here to do um, that uh, should keep us busy for decades uh, without sort of wondering where the next or who the next leadership of Palestine should be. Great. So um, I do have a question. Um, one of my mentors uh, had so said to me that um, understanding the connection between movements is a blessing because you see our common humanity as Muhammad said, but it's also a burden because it means that we oftentimes have to be in multiple places and there are so many, um, you know, hinders to our movement work. So I just wanted to, um, we have, you know, we're winding down the webinar, but I wanted to maybe shift a little bit to the personal in terms of uh, oftentimes I do get questions from activists of how do you manage, you know, how do you sustain yourself, you know, uh, of, been in this work for a long time and so I get this question a lot and I, I think that the more we say it's everything's connected and I gotta worry about South Africa, I gotta worry about like Colombia, I gotta work about indigenous community, you gotta work back liberation and you know I'm a, a labor activist so I gotta work about labor and class issues you know when do I have time and then I have two kids right, uh, I'm a mother, uh, I am a, a daughter, uh, I am a friend uh, you know, uh, and so how do we, how do we, how do we intersect on a daily le level? So, um, anyone who wants to maybe address that, and then we're gonna um, give some closing remarks. Silence. <laughs> uh, does Mohammed uh, uh, want to sort of address how, how do you manage all this movement building work? Um, we must find it firstly within ourselves to push ourselves a little further but also I think I really like the idea of you reminding us uh, Chamtoli, you reminding us that we are that we are lovers at the end of the day, that we are partners, that we are mothers, yeah. that we are sisters and this is important. Uh, we are not just uh, all the activists. Yes, we must try to bring activism into our lives but we must also remember that we are human beings. We only have 24 hours in the day. We can only take on this much. Uh, we must also also nurture ourselves, those around us, and our relations uh, with, with, with other people. So the first, the first, the first necessary condition to be a human rights activist is to be human, is to be alive, and therefore to take care of yourselves, uh, to, to nurture yourself. So that's my, my only contribution I can make, Chantori. I don't have anything profound that's to right. say uh, <laughs> uh, to that uh, to that question. Um, Zoe, or uh, would you like to add? Um, yeah, I think this is really difficult, especially right now in Colombia. Um, every day there, are, I think since the beginning of March, there have been over 100 social activists assassinated. So our workload is like extremely high um, and it's stressful. We're in the, I mean, living in Colombia, we're living in the midst of an armed conflict. There are friends who are getting incarcerated every day for their activism. It's a really tense situation and difficult. But for me, um, when we talk, when I'm talking about peace in Colombia, when I'm, we're talking about the solution to armed conflict, I see Palestine there. I see how our solidarity work is necessary. And as I said before, the liberation 
and peace in Colombia can only be it will be hand, will go hand in hand with the liberation of Palestinians. I see that like when military aid stops coming into Colombia, when it stops going to Israel, when the Palestinian people can be free, when the Colombian people are not living in a military state, that's when we're all going to be free. And so, as it, it's sometimes hard because the mental load of like hearing every day another activist he worked with is it's really difficult. And so for me. Having knowing that those struggles are linked and knowing that one goes hand in hand with the other is what kind of helps me and pushes me forward to keep working on this. Great. So um, we have uh, just a few minutes. So what I'd like to do is ask each of our panelists to give um, some closing remarks. A lot of the margins, um, the sort of three um, tags is to inquire to investigate and to involve. And so part of it is being informed, as Ahmed said, about education, um, to investigate, to sort of really know what we're talking about, know our strategies and our tactics. And the, the crucial part, uh, those of us who are organizers, is to get folks involved. So in your closing remarks, if you can uh, end also with a very concrete call to action for the registrants, um, that would be helpful. So let's maybe go in the order of our panelists. So, um, so Kamal, some closing remarks, maybe things that we haven't addressed, and a, you know, a specific call to action, and it may be something that you're working on at the moment. Sure. Um, I, mean, I, I think as we look at this period that we're in, um, we are we actually are on an upswing again of the solidarity that's happening. Uh, particularly, you know, in the communities that I work in, in terms of uh, black organizers and activists uh, and Palestinian organizers and activists. And sometimes we downplay the, the sort of um, way in which social media has allowed that opening to take place. But it's an important uh, opening that's, that's happening right now. And I think, you know, it's, it's important for all of us to sort of walk through that opening um, and start to talk to people again about this particular issue. I think a lot of times, uh, because of some of the things that folks just laid out, uh, we are so busy with uh, other parts of our life um, and other organizing things that we do that we forget about how important that intersectionality, that solidarity is. Um, and we're reaching a point where there are some schisms. It doesn't mean that the, the whole um, artifice is about to fall, but there are some schisms there that we can certainly sort of break into and open up into. Um, and one of the things I would mention in terms of uh, current work that's happening, the organization I work for, the American Friends Service Committee, has also played a great role recently uh, in the BDS movement, has adopted a BDS strategy as part of its own. Uh, but this is an organization that has 51 offices across the United States, over 72 programs internationally, inclusive of what they have here. Um, and I think it's up to large organizations and churches and uh, religious affiliation, affiliated organizations uh, to take a certain lead in doing this type of work, particularly since I think some of the historical precedent in which Israel is based on is a religious one. Uh, it's obviously a nationalist European enterprise, uh, but it's also based on a certain uh, religious thinking. And I think it's up to other religious organizations to also take a lead in trying to stop that from happening and have a counter narrative. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, Amen. Thank you. Um, I just want to uh, end this by saying that I'm extremely encouraged uh, by the current times that we're working within uh, in this movement. Um, not only am I encouraged by the fact that on a daily basis I continue to see Americans from all uh, races and ethnic backgrounds engaging in Palestine solidarity support, but I actually continue to meet young Arab Americans, Muslim Americans, Palestinian Americans who are actively engaged in the day-to-day -day fights here domestically. And that to me is just as important as engaging in solidarity work. And so if I had any um, you know, plea for everyone out here, it's to get involved in some form of liberation work, whether it's Palestine, black liberation work, whether you're working with undocumented and immigrant communities who are trying to escape uh, abuse after abuse and, and looking to seek comfort in the home, um, whether you're lo looking at advocating for LGBTQ communities um, and their rights to exist freely in this world, I think you're doing the liberation work necessary to catapult this solidarity movement to where it needs to go. And so again, I'm, I'm encouraged when I meet Palestinians at this lo uh, national rally we just had in D.C. We're working all across the country in different facets and forms of liberation work. That's what we need to do. We need to struggle together. When we realize that my victory is tied to yours, 
uh, we will be empowered to do such. Um, so thank you very much for the opportunity, um, and I look forward to seeing you all in liberated Palestine. Thank you. Um, Mohammed, some closing remarks. Sure. Um, uh, Ahmed has really uh, touched on something important, that is your victory is my victory. Often we talk about an injury to one is an injury to all, but we must also talk about and celebrate the gains that we are making. Um, the one point that I'd make perhaps is we must be able to take our communities and those around us from where they are to where we want them to be. Don't dismiss them, don't disregard them. They may be, they may be antagonistic or hesitant towards certain ideas, but at the end of the day we want to take them with us, we want, them to take, we want to take them along, we don't want to isolate uh, them. And I do want to emphasize, um, I said it earlier, but I do want to emphasize that there's nothing wrong with being angry, there's nothing wrong with disturbing the status quo. The, the apartheid regime in South Africa was was a peaceful regime in many ways, and it was a, it was our duty to disturb that peace. It was a duty to create a peace based on justice, and this is ultimately what we are all striving and thriving towards. Great, and um, Zoe. Folks in the U.S., folks in South Africa, India, it's been really amazing. Um, and yeah, kind of the, echoing what everyone else has said, um, the international solidarity and intersectionality is so crucial to this. Oh my! Oh yeah, um, to this yeah. work, and um, hopefully, <laughs> um, a vic soon. Yeah, we'll be in a liberated Palestine, a Colombia with peace, and South Africa without economic injustice. But yeah, thank you so much. Thank you all for participating in this um, discussion. Um, I think it's always, um, to me, a beautiful moment uh, when we have longtime activists who are committed on the ground, who uh, have probably a gazillion things to do in this hour and a half, um, but take time to lend solidarity, love, and support for each other. So, you know, I extend back to um, to Mohammed, to Zoe, to Kamal, and Ahmed for uh, really coming on and sharing your experiences of today uh, for a lot at the margins. Um, I do want to uh, give a little couple of acknowledgments before we close. Um, one is that, um, as happens, our registrants and participants that are listening are equally uh, could have been guests, uh, and so we don't at Law at the Margins draw any distinction between experts and panelists, um, but that our discussions are catalysts. They move us towards discussion, and so I invite all of our participants um, to reach out to me uh, for future programs or to ideas that they want to facilitate. And one such panelist, um, Samir, reminds us of the book that was the impetus for this discussion, Angela Davis, freedom is a constant struggle. So to the question about what sustains me is continually engagement, love and support for the community. And knowing that through the constant engagement and that we can achieve some of the uh, victories that we want. I want to thank Val Marina as well as Ever Hanner, two law students who are spring law interns with Law at the Margins, for assisting and tweeting uh, this uh, program. This program is going to be recorded and available and can be actually disseminated as well. And then finally, uh, last but not least, uh, I definitely want to thank Albert Garcia, uh, who is behind the scenes, our tech uh, producer, behind all of our webinars. Um, support us so that we can continue to foster these discussions. And again, thank you to each of you and, um, and see you on the path. Peace. Peace. Adiós.